a director of research from LPTMS in Paris, who's going to talk about optimal resetting and grounding bridges. Okay. So, so thank you very much. And uh, let me start by thanking the organizers for the invitation. It's a great pleasure to be back here in ICTF. ICT? Oh, sorry. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> so it's a great pleasure to be back to be ICTP. And I must apologize that, uh, you know, probably in contrast to the other speakers, my talk will be entirely Markovian. Okay. <laughs> but as you, as you heard this morning from Leticia that, you know, our van campaign, that uh, non-Markov processes are rules and uh, Markov processes are exceptions. So, but you need an exception to prove the rule. So, <laughs> so, so I'll talk about uh, optimal uh, resetting Brownian bridges. And so this is a sort of uh, recent work which was uh, done in collaboration with Gregory Sher, my uh, friend and long-time collaborator, and also with our graduate student, Benjamin D. Bruin. And uh, this will, uh, this is it's on the archive and it will appear in PRL soon. Okay, so here is the sort of uh, three parts to my talk. So in the first part, I'll, talk, I'll just make a brief, brief recap of the resetting Brownian motion. This morning, you have already heard twice uh, about the stochastic resetting. So, but today I'm going to talk about the slightly different aspects of it, the first passage aspects, uh, and uh, just remind you what it is uh, in a very simple context. Uh, and then I'll come to the main body of the talk, which is about the resetting Brownian bridge. And, uh, and if time permits, there's a very interesting algorithmic question, how to generate such resetting Brownian bridges uh, in a sort of efficient rejection-free way. Can you write down an effective Langevin equation for that? But I, I suspect that I won't have time to get into the third part. So anyway, so let me start with the first part, just to remind you a little bit what, is, uh, what was our original motivation for stochastic resetting. And uh, so this was uh, basically motivated from search processes. So as you know, search problems are ubiquitous in nature. Uh, for example, it could be the animal searching for food or in visual search, when you are looking for a face of a friend in the milieu of uh, you know, big, large number of people, and or for example, the a protein searching for a site on a DNA target site to bind, uh, or even in combinatorial optimization problems, where you have a large dimensional random landscape and you want to find the global minimum by some simulated handling or some other dynamics. Uh, and uh, so in all these problems, you see this uh, it's sort of intuition tells us that if you search for a while in vain and you don't find the target, maybe you should you know, stop your search and uh, start from the scratch. That means from the same initial condition. And the rationale behind it is uh, that you might find a new pathway and uh, which will expedite the search for the uh, target. Okay? I mean, we see that all the time. I mean, for example, you know, if you're looking for a bug in your computer program, I mean, uh, you often get lost in subroutines and uh, blah, blah, blah. And then, uh, you know, basically best strategy is to actually restart from the beginning. And then often you can find the bug. Okay. So this was the original motivation that we started out with. And we wanted to sort of quantitatively estimate, does resetting, uh, that means, you know, from time to time going back to the initial condition, does it really, you know, uh, expedite the uh, search process, uh, the speed of the search process? Uh, and uh, so about 10 years back with uh, Martin Evans, we introduced, we studied this question in the context of a very simple mod search process, which is just a Brownian searcher, okay? And uh, so here's this model. So let me first tell you what happens without resetting. All of you know this. So imagine that you have just have a Brownian walker in one dimension for simplicity, but you can do it in higher dimensions also. And uh, so you have a walker which starts at the initial position x naught. In, in my talk, Vertical axis will always be the space, and horizontal axis is time. So it starts at x naught, and it just does diffusion. And then you have a target at a position L up there. And uh, you want to know when is the first time the uh, process hits the target L. So that's the first passage time. And that's, that will be taken as the search time, basically, searching this target so to find this target. And th this problem is very easy to compute. I mean, it's a classical problem. So to calculate the first passage probability, it's better to calculate the cumulative distribution. That means cumulative first passage probability, or what is called the survival probability. So which means that what is the probability that the particle starting at x0 does not meet the target up to time t. Okay? And it's very easy to, sh and the subscript 0 here means without resetting. So this is, you know, it's very easy to sort of write down a differential equation for this. This is a backward differential equation where you vary the initial position x0. 
and you have to put the absorbing boundary condition at x not equal to L, because if you start exactly at L, then immediately you find the target, so the survival probability of the target is zero. And so you just have to solve this differential equation for x not less than or equal to L with this absorbing boundary condition. And the solution is classic, uh, classical, I mean it's just the error function of L minus x not by square root of 4 dt, where error function is just the integral of a Gaussian. Okay, so therefore, to calculate the first passage probability, which is the minus time derivative of the survival probability, because survival probability is integral of the first passage from t to infinity. So when you take a derivative, there's a negative sign. And so the, this is very simple, it's a well-known expression. And what you see is that for fixed L minus x naught, as you take the time goes to infinity, it, it has a fat tail, it decays as t to the power minus three by two, which means that if I calculate the expected value of the time, x mean first passage time, this is strictly infinite because of this tail t to the power minus three by two. So, and this is because, you see, what happens is that, uh, so the trajectories that contribute to the mean, <coughs> there are trajectories where the particle actually starts from here and wanders away to minus infinity, and therefore never finds the target. And it's because of those trajectories that contribute to the mean that the mean first passage time is actually divergent. So even though the first passage probability exists, but the mean first, first moment diverges. And what resetting does, Essentially, it cuts off those wandering trajectories, okay? So let me just show you how, how it does that. So resetting means, basically, the model is very, very simple. So you just say that your stochastic process x of t now evolves by the following rule. So with probability r dt, where r is the resetting rate, you go back to the initial position x0, okay? And with the complementary probability, 1 minus r dt, you just do diffusion. That means you just increment your process by a Gaussian white noise. and uh, <coughs> And that's it, so R is the only parameter in the system. And uh, so the question is that what happens to the mean first passage time now, okay? Now, of course, what, what uh, you know, resetting also does is that it drives the system into a dynamical, you know, in a, into a non-equilibrium stationary state because it sort of creates dynamically a potential around the initial position and the particle gets trapped there, which was uh, shown this morning. So I'll not talk about that aspect here. Here I'm just focusing on the first passage aspect. Okay, so how do we calculate the first passage probability? Very simple. So again, it's a sort of same renewal equation that you have seen before uh, in some way. So QR of x zero t, so now the subscript R means in the presence of resetting, survival probability. So there are two possibilities. Either there is no resetting in this time interval zero to t, which happens with probability e to the power minus RT because this is just a Poisson process. And then you have to ensure that within this time interval it did not cross the target, so it's Q zero x zero t. Or there are more than one resetting. So in that case, you just look at the time tau at which the first resetting occurs here. So the probability that the first resetting occurs between time tau and tau plus d tau is just r d tau times e to the power minus r tau. And up to that time tau, it's, it's evolving without resetting. So it's a q0 x0 tau. And then after that, it just renews the whole process. So therefore, again, you have qr x0 t minus tau. So it's a very simple renewal equation or Swinger Dyson equation, if you like. And you can actually solve it exactly by taking Laplace transform and using the convolution property. But I'll not go into the details, but the mean first passage time happens to be finite in this case, in the presence of resetting, and is given by a very, very simple formula here. Okay. So, so of course, when r equal to zero, it diverges, but for any finite r, this is actually a finite mean capture time. So that's the first thing that it does you know, make the mean first passage time much smaller compared to without resetting. And, uh, and if you, moreover, if you plot this mean first passage time, this formula here as a function of r for fixed L and x naught, so what you see is that it diverges as r goes to zero, okay? And also it diverges when r goes to infinity, okay? And the reason for that is that r goes to zero, as I said, there are wandering trajectories taking it away from the target, so the mean first passage time diverges, on the other hand, when r goes to infinity, you are resetting all the time to, to initial value x naught, and therefore you, you really never manage to go find the target. You are just completely localized around the initial position x naught. Okay? So it diverges in the two limits, and if you plot this function, you see that there's a minimum at some optimal value r star, which you can compute trivially. And so in dimensionless units, 
This R star is given by D over L minus X naught square. And so gamma is a dimensionless number, which is just given by the solution of this transcendental equation. Okay? So this was the, so it was nice that there is an optimal first passage time, uh, that um, optimal resetting rate that makes the mean first passage time minimal. And then, you know, this, it turns out that this is a very robust phenomenon, this, this optimality, and it exists in all dimensions. It, you know, it occurs in various theoretical models, and also very recently it has been verified in experiments in optical traps, both from the group of Yale Roikman in uh, Tel Aviv, and also Sergio Silibato in ENS Leo. But I don't have time to talk about this. And over the last few years, you know, it has been really studied extensively in many, many different contexts and many, many different models. I mean, there's a long list, including active particles, quantum dynamics, and many other things. And uh, so there is a sort of a recent review article that I wrote with Martin and Gregory, uh, where some of these things are mentioned, but not everything, because the, the subject is evolving very fast. And as was mentioned this morning, that uh, this year, actually, so uh, Jeff uh, came up with a special issue, edited by Anupam Kundu and Slomi Ryubani, which is uh, about the 10 years of this diffusion and stochastic resetting. Okay, so this is the sort of background, and uh, let me now come to the main part of today's talk, which is about resetting Brownian bridge. What do I mean by that? And first I'll tell you the motivation for it. So, you know, in the previous problem, resetting Brownian motion, your search time, your process goes on forever, okay? There's no, you know, it's, it's, it's unlimited search, and then you are trying to find the time to find the target. But in most practical situations, the search time is never infinite. It's always limited. It's all a fixed duration. So, for example, when the animals are searching for food, uh, you know, they are this, uh, searching for food, they typically come back to the nest at the end of the day. So there's a time limited. Or, for example, if you are searching for some rescuers after a, uh, some survivors after a shipwreck, you typically send a helicopter. But, of course, helicopter doesn't move around forever. So uh, it's typically for two hours or three hours it searches and then it gives up and comes back to the initial position. Okay? So in uh, <coughs> many situations, basically the, the uh, search time is finite, limited, and at the end the searcher comes back to its initial position or some you know, final position basically. So, so this is the idea behind resetting Brownian bridge. Okay? And uh, so to be more precise, so here the model would be something like this. So essentially, what is resetting Brownian bridge? So it's again resetting Brownian motion as before, except that it starts at, so let's say, 0 for simplicity, and it comes back to a fixed position xf at some final fixed time t equal to tf. Okay? So this is the constraint. That it's conditioned to come back to some final position at some final fixed time tf. So you look at all possible resetting Brownian motion configurations, and you know, those which reach at xf at time tf, so those are the ones which are the relevant uh, allowed configurations, okay? So, so this is the model. And now you ask the question that now if I have a target at L, okay, so I have a fixed time of search, and I'm supposed to come back to some final position xf, which, which will typically take to be initial position zero, okay? And, and so the two questions that I want, three questions that you want to ask. So what's the first question? So is resetting still a good strategy in the presence of a bridge constraint? Because you, know, you don't have this problem that we had before. I mean, now, because your fin final, final time is limited, so you, know, you don't have wandering trajectories to minus infinity. Okay. So, so that problem is not there. Okay. So, so you know, the, the mean first passage time, even without resetting, will be finite. So it's not clear that resetting is still a good strategy. I mean, does it improve the first passage time? So that was the first question. And if it does, is there an optimal resetting rate still, R star, that minimizes the capture time of the target? Okay, so this is the second question. And the third question is that how do we actually, imagine that you are doing numerical simulations. How do you actually generate the paths that satisfy you know, these resetting Brownian bridge constraints, basically? I mean, naively, you might generate all possible resetting Brownian motion and keep only those configurations which reach xf at tf, but that will be very stupid because this will lead to a lot of rejections. So can you write down a rejection-free algorithm to generate such paths? Okay. This is not completely trivial. I mean, it's, this is a highly non-trivial question. Okay. So, so these are the three questions that we wanted to ask. 
And let me start with the first question. Is resetting a good strategy for a Brownian bridge? Is there an optimal paradigm here? OK. So, so let me first start with what happens without resetting again. So without resetting, just a Brownian bridge. So again, you, know, you start a Brownian bridge from initial position 0. And you are supposed to reach XF at final time TF. And uh, so, so here, let's first calculate the fluctuations. Okay? So if I am any fixed time t between 0 and tf, and I look at the fluctuations, mean square fluctuations, sigma square t, at that time t. So let's, this is easily computable. So let's compute that first, just to get an idea of the fluctuations. Okay. So how do we compute this? So for that, the, you know, again, since I'm a Markov man, so, <laughs> so it's very easy because uh, you know, to calculate this guy you know, you, at time t, you want to know what is the probability density that the particle reaches x at time t. So all you have to do is to split your interval from, into two, 0 to t and then t to tf. So in 0 to t, you just have a free Brownian propagation, g of x t, which is just a, just a normal Brownian propagator. And then final interval t to tf, you have another, so final position xf to tf starting at xt. And you just take the product because it's a Markov process. And you normalize it by all possible paths going from 0 to xf in time tf. Okay? So it's trivial to compute this. And you find that it is, as you expect, I mean, it, it, it's, it's a Gaussian uh, distribution with this, this mean here. And uh, the variance is actually uh, just 2dt times tf minus t over tf. So of course, the variance vanishes at the two ends because these two ends points are fixed. And in between, it fluctuates. And the fluctuation is maximum at the center. And it has a semicircular form, essentially, t times tf. OK, very good. This is without resetting. So now let's introduce resetting and what happens. Okay? So the question I'm after is that once I introduce resetting, does the fluctuation increase or decrease? It's not, it's not completely obvious, right? Naively, I would think that it will decrease because you know, your uh, paths are already, you know, fluctuations are less because you, know, you are, you are fix, uh, reaching the fixed point, uh, final point here. So if you introduce resetting, it will further localize this uh, trajectory towards the origin. So, so you would think that the fluctuation should decrease, right? Yes. No, you can reset, but this is the first. Andrea, you have to always first address the simplest question, right? You can write after many papers on <laughs> <laughs> resetting to different places. Okay. So, <laughs> all right. So, so let's uh, let's answer this simple question. So again, so I have this. You know, the, uh, it's a Markov process. So I split the interval into zero to t and t to tf, uh, and all I need, therefore is the propagator for the resetting Brownian motion in each of these intervals, and then I take the product and normalize it. OK, so how do you calculate the propagator for resetting Brownian motion? It's again very simple, again, renewal property. So, so imagine that you have a process starting at x0, and you look at up to time t. And now, instead of first resetting, you look at, it's convenient to look at the last resetting. So suppose the tau is the interval since the last resetting. And then you see that you know, if there are two possibilities again, the probability there is no resetting, and then it's just a free propagator. Okay? And then there's this resetting, more than one resetting. And in that case, you, know, you just look backwards from here, and you see that the probability that there's no resetting in this interval followed by a resetting event at this is just this probability. And from here to here, it's just a free evolution, but starting at 0. Therefore, it's x squared over 4 d tau. So this is very simple, the resetting prop, uh, propagator. And so once we have that, we just you know, plug in here uh, and take the product and compute this. Uh, so it's, it's quite simple calculation. And uh, what you find is that, again, if you write in, in terms of dimensionless time and uh, dimensionless resetting rate, uh, that is just a simple function of A and R. Okay? And this is dimensionless because 2 dtf comes over here. Now this function you can calculate explicitly. But don't look at the details of this. But mainly, what you find is the following. OK? So I want to see that, remember that first, let's look at the r equal to 0. When there's no resetting, it was a semicircular law. In these units, it's just a times 1 minus a. So it was this. And now I just switch on a little bit of resetting, let's say. What will happen? Does the fluctuation will increase or decrease? I mean, I expected that it will decrease because 
introduce resetting, it will localize towards more towards the origin. But what you see from this from exact computation is that it actually increases. Okay? So it first increases, and then if you increase further the resetting rate R, so then of course it decreases. Okay? So it, it starts from the semicircular law and then it sort of increases and then again decreases. Okay? So this was a bit surprising. I mean, why do the fluctuations first increase and then decrease? Okay? <laughs> Actually, Benjamin did the simulation before <laughs> doing the computation. So, <laughs> okay, so now I'll tell you why. Okay, it's all due to Uber taxi. I'll tell you why. <laughs> so, okay, so here is this. So this is the sort of main result. And in fact, I mean, if you look at the, uh, just the, let's say the maximal value of the mean square fluctuation and plot it as a function of R, so what you find is that it increases, achieves a maximum at some R star equal to 0.895 and then starts decreasing. So what's the sort of mechanism? This mechanism is very different. So there is an optimal value of resetting rate at which the fluctuations become maximal, which means it, it can actually find the target. If there's a target up there, it can actually find the, easy, the, find the target easier. But the mechanism for that is very different from resetting Brownian motion. So here, what's the mechanism of this enhanced fluctuation? The mechanism is the following. You see that when r equal to zero, no resetting. So imagine that you are, you know, you are walking, um, just taking a walk before dinner and you are supposed to come back for dinner at home exactly at eight o'clock, right? That's your bridge condition. So you don't walk too far, right? Because you have to come back by walking. But if you can call a Uber taxi, if you have that option, you can just come at the last minute. So you would like to venture out further. Okay, so that's the mechanism, okay? And, uh, and this was, uh, so, uh, so the, we call it fluctuation enhancing mechanism. So, uh, so, this, this, so you see this for the bridge, the, Indeed, there is an optimal value of resetting rate, but the reason, physical reason, is very different from uh, the resetting Brownian motion, where the mechanism was just cutting off the trajectory that wanders off to minus infinity. Okay. So this is the sort of main result, and I'll just uh, okay. After that, we can do many things. Many. Do you have an idea what the magic number, the R star, is? No magic number. I mean, it's actually. I mean, no. You just have to take this function and uh, take a derivative equal to zero, that's all. There's no nothing yeah. magic. In fact, this ma the actual value of this r is not very important. It depends on the observable. See, here I'm looking at the x squared, but I'll just show you. Okay. I mean, in fact, if you compute, for example, I mean, I can also calculate the hitting probability. What's the probability that the target will be found? And then you find a different value of r star. But the fact that there is an r star in no matter which observable you look at, I mean, and that's because of this me yeah. enhancing mechanism, okay? Okay, so here is the heating probability. Again, you can compute the heating probability exactly. Heating probability means what's the probability that the target will be found within this fixed time TF. Because you know, there is a finite probability that you may not find the target. Okay? So you can ask what is the probability that I'll find the target. And again, you can compute this explicitly. I'm not showing you the formula. But, uh, but if you, again, plot this as a function of R, you again see that there is an optimal value R star at which it becomes maximal. Okay? So, and then, uh, you know, other thing is expected maximum you can calculate, and that also does it. And it also occurs in all dimensions. So, for example, I mean, I can go into higher dimension. So, zero, zero, I start from zero, zero, and suppose I go to some uh, one, one, one TF, and you see that D equal to one, two, three, everywhere is always the same phenomenon. That is, uh, you know, blue curve is the R equal to zero. You increase resetting, then fluctuations first increase, and then decrease. Okay? It happens in all dimensions. Okay, so I think my time is up. So this was the third part. I don't have time to talk about this. But mainly the question here, as I said, you know, how do we actually numerically generate such, uh, such resetting Brownian bridges? Okay, I mean, beyond the costly naive way. And uh, so for that, we, actually, there's a way to compute an effective Langevin equation, which is exact, where you, know, you have a drift term and a resetting rate. But now the drift, as well as the resetting term, both are space and time dependent, and you can compute them explicitly, and that way you can generate these uh, this, uh, trajectories with the correct statistical weight, you know, without any rejection, basically. But okay, that's for maybe another talk, so let me summarize. Uh, so, so again, resetting Brownian bridge sort of is an efficient search strategy for diffusive searches with a finite duration TF, uh, and, uh, and the optimal paradigm holds uh, via this new mechanism, which is this fluctuation enhancing mechanism, 
which is completely different from that of the usual resetting Brownian motion. And, uh, and in, we can actually compute in a sort of an exact Langevin equation, effective Langevin equation, with a uh, space-time dependent you know, drift and resetting rate, which uh, generates these paths in a rejection-free way. And um, so, you know, to conclude again, the stochastic resetting is always, you know, it, it sort of keeps on, keeps on popping up with uh, very rich and interesting and static and dynamical phenomena. And the thing about this is, is that this, this is a very simple system. So you can actually do many calculations analytically. So that's quite nice. So let me acknowledge my collaborators over many years. Uh, so these are all the graduate students uh, and master students and also, you know, including people from here. Uh, Gennaro and Andrea, that's, uh, and here are some selected references uh, on stochastic resetting. So thank you very much. Go ahead. Thank you very much for the talk. Uh, we have time for a few questions. Are there any questions in the audience or online? I can maybe ask one. I'm sure you already either are thinking about it or have calculated it already. Have you looked at the extreme, st extreme statistics of, yeah. of, of this resetting bridge? Yes. Yeah, so I, <laughs> I, I went too fast there. Uh, yeah, so we computed the expected maximum, for example, of this yeah, process. Yeah. And you, again, you, you can compute, and again, you find a sort of R star there. Uh, for which it becomes maximal, actually. So, so is, there any, is there any connection between the expected maximum without the resetting and the optimal rate with resetting? So basically that you would have a rate that on average either switches after you have reached the maximum or something? Not really, not really. So I mean, it's, it's really the ob all observables, they have quite different, I mean, you so cannot connect so easily the R star of each of the observables, basically. Yeah. So it's, it's more subtle. Yeah, it's more subtle than that, yes. Okay, so let's see if you have already considered what I was suggesting. <laughs> so yes. imagine now you. No, <laughs> yeah. Okay, no, because if you have, uh, if, you res if, you, if your home is in a different place compared to where to you reset, uh, yes. and it, depending on whether it's in the direction of the target or not, uh, this competition between. Uh, yes, yes. No, this is an interesting Enhancing and reducing. Yes. No, no, Gennaro, exactly. take note. What is it? <laughs> <laughs> okay. No, no, this is, but you know, I mean, in, in all these resetting problems, I mean, I always say that, you know, resetting to any fixed position is like a Green's function for resetting to arbitrary position. Yes. Right? You just have to integrate over the, uh, with, over the yes. kernel license. So, so essentially one can, but, but that could be interesting effect because we know that, for example, I mean, if you have a spread in the initial condition, this was in Silibato's experiments, yeah. that if you have a spread in the initial condition, it drives, gives rise to a lot of interesting yeah. effects. So I'm sure here also, if you have a spread in the resetting positions, that will also give rise to quite a bit of interesting physics. So there's still quite a few open problems here. So. Okay. So uh, have you thought about this um, model, but in the presence of some sort of non-equilibrium besides the resetting? Because you, uh -huh. look, you mean this, this is a diffusion, which is a passive uh, motion. So you could have an, a potential or an yeah. external sure. non-conservative force, et cetera. Sure. In that case, you can also discuss cost of the, of the process. Yes, uh, no, that, that's, 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 nobody has done that, so okay. it's free. Sure. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> <laughs> Okay, but but you didn't even think of a particle with a drift, so it's always no, no. This I mean, this was just you know, this is mm, still the two months old oh, <laughs> work okay, basically. Okay. So so we just uh, just looked at these basic things. I mean, we have not really you know looked at the other modifications of it. Yes. Are there any more questions? Um, to what extent do you think non-instantaneous resetting would affect this? Yeah, this is a, this is a good question again. So, I mean, this is related to you know this Silibato's uh, experiment. So, you know, I mean, in all these models, we always you know assume that it's instantaneous resetting, but of course, in reality, you know, it's never instantaneous resetting, right? So, in the experiment, for example, what they use, the protocol they use is uh, so they let the particle diffuse for a while, and then they you know switch on an optical trap, right? So the, and then the particle relaxes in the optimal trap. And during the relaxation period, you don't take any measurement, okay? And at the end, you come back, you know, to some equilibrium position. 
And you see, when you come back to the equilibrium position, you are never a delta function, right? You're sitting to one fixed position. But there's a spread, basically. That this is what uh, Andrea was referring to. There's a spread. And this spread actually has a very interesting effect. And this is what was, you know, came out of Silberto's experiments, basically. Okay. So, uh, so, so non-instantaneous resetting has important effects. Uh, and uh, it should be studied, but again, it has not been studied. I mean, and I, I suspect that with the bridge and non non and bridge constraint plus the non-instantaneous uh, um, uh, resetting would have an interesting effect. Tom. All right, time for the last question. You, you have extended your calculation to higher dimensions. Yes. It says, I mean, you get, actually, for d bigger than or equal to 2, you have to have a target with a finite size always, as you know. I mean, because, you know, if you have diffusion, you might may miss this thing. So if you, you just have to put a circle, basically, you know, or the sphere of a radius, finite radius, basically. Yeah. yeah. OK, if there are no more questions, I suggest uh, we move okay. the discussion to the coffee break. Uh, let's thank again, Sakima Jumda. Thank you for coming.